All right, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What the Theory with your man Joel. I'm Joel. Actually, my middle name is Anthony, so. Yeah. Do you saying? mind calling you? So who's going to be middle I'll, name? We'll call you Tony or call you Anthony? Call me Tony. Tony. So, yeah. Tony, please, can you introduce yourself to the esteemed audience? Uh, I want to see how much you say about yourself when you're given the chance. Um, my name is Anthony Natif. I am. Um, I usually like to describe myself from what I hear people say about me because oftentimes whatever they say has a certain level of truth. <laughs> There's guys who say, oh, this guy is one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. He's uh, generous, he's uh, humble to a fault, he's very smart. And then the other guys go Who like, are these people saying? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> then other guys go like, man, that's the most evil dude you'll ever meet. He's super vindictive. Like, the king uh, of violence online. He's violent. Uh, he's uh, extremely obsessive about certain things that shouldn't really matter. You know, <laughs> along that spectrum, every one of the descriptions can fall mm. in a certain grade of truth. Mm. So uh, I'm, I'm a mixed bag. Mixed uh, bag. Messed up like anyone else. Uh, hoping that... Uh, at the end of my life, when they pull out a scorecard, I've probably done more good than bad. Mm. I can deal with that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So you're a humble lad. I, I mean, so they say, but I, 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 I quite frankly don't think I am. When you say you're, you, when you say you're humble, that's the epitome. Ah, yeah. of other, not being other people humble. are supposed to say. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Oftentimes, I, whoever says I'm evil or great or nice, in between, they're always right. Every one of them is right. I get the feeling people say that because they're surprised when they realize the accomplishments that you've had, you know. Uh, I, I remember seeing um, on the timeline one time, who's this guy in shorts all the time talking? Then other guys coming to defend you. Do you know how much money that guy has made? So I was just looking at how we weigh and support <laughs> individuals. So if you had not made the money you've made, if you've not accomplished the things you've accomplished, somehow your opinion is not worth listening to. Exactly. And, and you know... <laughs> I know you like philosophy. Uh, there's this uh, uh, French Marxist philosopher called, uh, I think it was called Guy Ernest uh, de Boer. Mm. Uh, he talks about the society of the spectacle. Mm. Uh, we have. Stop laughing. <laughs> I'm just happy that people are referencing things that I also. I yeah, like so he talks enough. about the society of the spectacle. We live in a universe where uh, our interaction with people is largely reinforced by images. Mm. Images that reinforce other images. You see a guy shares a meme and then he talks about some uh, part of your life and you're like, oh, that guy gets me. Mm. Uh, we live in a society where it's no longer about, you know, fake it till you make it. Successfully faking it is making it. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and really our definition of what is valuable has been reduced to the optics of success. So mm. when someone comes and defends my opinion because they think I made a lot of money, it, it, it saddens me, but I also understand that that is uh, uh, the society in which we live, that uh, opinion has to be bought. Mm. Uh, you don't have to really pay, you just have to have the understanding of society that this guy made it. And as far as the, 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 the standards defined and set by uh, a very superficial society is mm. concerned. Uh, wow. I would much rather someone comes and defends my opinion because it speaks to uh, their basic human beliefs. It, it breaks my heart to see them leading with, man, you know that dude is a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> that, Therefore, he that, must have sense. Yeah, that's stuff must that, have sense. That, that's stuff that... <laughs> It really yeah. doesn't speak to who I am, and I, I don't mm. uh, obsess over bank balance or the business or businesses are built or stuff like that. Okay. I come to the marketplace of ideas, hoping to engage at that level of, uh, you know, understanding. How do you understand something? Can we push back? Can you challenge your viewpoint? Can I challenge your viewpoint? Mm. Can you challenge mine? I would much rather have those. But I do I, I appreciate the, 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 <laughs> the props, the, the defense, not the props. The props are really, uh, I take a lot of credit for people who toiled to build that company. And mm. a lot of the things we built, I, unfairly. 
I never used to hear such things at Pakasa. What is it, Pakasa for? But we shall discuss that for another. <laughs> uh, you quoted Guy Debord, and uh, the thing I liked about that book was, at a certain point, he takes uh, Marx's um, conversation around in a society which is based on capital accumulation, um, wealth looks like an immense accumulation of assets, of things, of commodities. Yes. But he turned it to, in a society of spectacle, it is the accumulation of images. It is the accumulation of how am I perceived. Even if you don't really have a lot or you're not really happy, as long as you're perceived that way, you will have impact. So I'm asking, I, I guess, why are you... I guess standing aside from that, what pulled you out of it? Had you always been politically conscious, socially conscious? Is it something that has recently been reawakened? Or I, I'm, I'm interested in your journey towards how you reached this conclusion. So yesterday, um, I was at an Emiliano event and uh, a kid asked me this very question. Uh, very smart lawyer. He's like, why is it that you only started speaking up after you gamed uh, capitalism. Uh, you know, often times we start out Maslow's hierarchy of needs, or oh, you've <laughs> sorted this, 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 mm. this, then I can now speak up. But then I told them uh, I had been speaking up 15 years ago, 10 years ago when we started having WhatsApp groups and all that stuff. Mm. Go to the Namiango WhatsApp group, I would speak about this stuff. But like you started uh, this conversation, the voice probably wasn't as amplified by society because they didn't believe I had the platform. <laughs> so now financial success, unfortunately, <laughs> seemed to have given me a certain level of, 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 of notoriety, but yeah. also recognition. Mm. So then when you're speaking up, you're, you're, you're really a mirror of success. And whatever you talk about, society will listen to that because they also want to get to that level of success, which is a shame. Yeah. Uh, but whatever gets the message out there will take it mm. but yeah uh, uh, this civic awareness uh, has always been with me because i grew up you know i grew up in a very poor society yet my father was a very educated man mm. uh, cambridge educated uh, uh, was a district education officer grew through the ranks he loved education he would hobnob with some of the most powerful people we have in this country but then he just quit, called Taki, and went to Seta and said, you know, I don't believe in how you guys are running this thing. I'll go to Seta, run my bar, lodge, <laughs> restaurant, read newspapers and books and write. And he's done that for nearly 35 years. Wow. So he had uh, more than 20 children, I'm one of the youngest. Mm. Uh, we had to find a way of uh, getting through school. So then that meant that I spent a lot of time hustling. I would buy the shoe on my feet the shirt on my back from the age of six. Uh, so I, I would work with guys who were maybe 20, 30 years old, pushing water mm. in Zeta to sell to rich people. So I understood very well the division of class as informed by economics. Mm. So those issues always spoke to me. So when I see uh, them happening in today's society, I feel like um, the way you course correct is by correcting the systemic disadvantages that people grow up with mm. that are brought upon by a system that just doesn't function mm. or it only functions for a certain class of people. Mm. And so there's a righteous anger, should I say, that I've always lived with and I'm willing to always put my resources, time, some money and whatever to yeah. try and correct. Okay. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, it's admirable. I think uh, a lot of people tie themselves to these stories. Before I was speaking, I was saying, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a planned kid. I'm, I'm, I'm a planned kid. <laughs> Are you in Kololo? Look. I was, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Stan Big Mac. Uh, so, but I know the proximate distance I had to understanding where things came from is because my father was uh, born to a carpenter for the kingdom of Toro. And the dreams that my grandfather had were that my dad would go to school and that he would, you know, the dream of he would then go to Kampala and make everything right. So I remember as the firstborn seeing the success of my father and my grandfather going, you see, he's made it. Now also you, you have to, you know, build on top of it. Proper Toro aristocracy. Those things. Mm -hmm. Now, 
unfortunately, I think my grandmother was the kind of person who wanted to remind us where we came from. So every time we go to the village, we'd be like, uh -huh, we're going to go and collect firewood. We're going to like you needed to know how the things that you enjoy around come about. Mm. But all the people I grew up with, um, I think political consciousness was lost simply because our everyday experience did not show mm. those things. You know, I'm, we're not reminded on a daily about what has to go into just preparing our food, into keeping us feeling safe, that, you know, even the phrase passive income, whenever I hear it, is, it's only passive for you because someone else is laboring mm. to get it. Now, <clears throat> in other groups of people that I've spoken to, in you know, even the things I see online, there's righteous anger, like you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. But because, um, whether it's the great man view of history or whatever, we are always pushing that view onto specific individuals. It's mm. like, these guys need to get out of here. And that's the tenor that I hear in our So how is it that you are not taking that route? I even saw you at some point defending. Um, there was a, <laughs> there was a uh, <laughs> uh, uh, discussion where I think someone was calling out their parents. Of, mm. uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, mm. the hashtag, you know, uh, to do with the parliament. Mm. And how they were speaking about the speaker's appearance. Mm and insulting her. And you're like, let's not reduce ourselves to that kind mm. of conversation. We're discussing systems. Now that kind of patience, that kind of diligence, how come you have it and other people don't? Where, where do you think you are spared, I think, the personalization of the evils in society? Interesting. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't want to call it a certain level of moral superiority. I'm, I'm anything but moral. But... Uh, <laughs> Clip that. We're going to, that's going to be the ad. <laughs> but... You know, I have a, 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 an understanding that uh, society and the leaders we get are a reflection of the societies in which we exist. Mm -hmm. There's an, uh, uh, should I, it sounds poetic, but there's an arrow of evil and good that pierces through every man's heart. Uh, how then does someone choose to exist on the evil side? Uh, shameless accumulation of wealth and all that stuff instead of looking out for uh, the guy they left in the village mm. so you need to be able to understand that at, at, at a primal level mm. that if I've grown up looking at a very unfair society that rewards whoever grows up and gets to the top of the food chain in terms of uh, being a politician then I'm going to struggle to also get there and just do exactly that. Uh, man see, man do. Mm. So I am a bit, a lot more forgiving of people's mistakes when it comes to that. Mm. I understand that we, when we get leaders, we're fishing from the same lake. Mm. So I have a lot more grace extended to these people. Mm. Okay. Having said that, it doesn't mean that I... I I stop calling them out. I call them out beyond just their physical attributes. You're tall, you're dark, you, you, ble you bleached, you did what. Mm. They're struggling to fit into a certain definition of society, what's cool in society, as, as we've said it. And they just have happen to have gamed the system and they have enough resources. Yeah. Extend to them that grace because you also need your own grace. Mm. And then figure out a way that you can discuss issues if I come to you and I'm like, Joel, oh, I don't like your grey beard. Okay? Immediately, I'm... Immediately, you're going to put up a defense. Mm. But my not liking your grey beard is not informed by any understanding that scientific, scientific ways that, oh, people with grey beards are evil, or they're terrible, or they're thieves, <laughs> or they're this, or they're this. Yeah. It probably is informed by uh, my own upbringing. This, uh, you, again, back mm. to your... To, not philosophy this time, psychology, there's something we call thin slicing. I find you, I'm like, okay, grey beard, these guys are like this. If I don't allow myself to listen to you, to give you audience, to hear you, tell me your truth, as informed by your own lived experience, yeah. I rob myself of a chance to learn mm. and unlearn. Mm -hmm. So I engage from a perspective of wanting to learn. You understand? So what's there for me to learn from talking about uh, the speaker's uh, <laughs> choice of skin color and how she got to that. Mm. It is not germane to the conversation. Like a guy will say, man, you can go, you're short. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
it's an easy way to dismiss. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's yeah. not a conversation that I want to engage in. Yeah. So can we then elevate it a little bit and just talk about the issues? So someone doesn't start off from a defensive perspective. Mm. Okay. Now, um, when you had just come, we were talking about um, <laughs> Buganda Kingdom. Yes. Oh, oh man. I wanted to touch on this. <laughs> I want to touch on yes, this. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, because uh, the young man, I didn't really follow the story quite well. Unfortunately, I saw he was um, arrested. I think he's still detained. I don't think yeah, he's yeah, been released. He came up to court the other day and uh, they extended his detention by maybe another week. The, the, sometimes when I look at our justice system, I am my heart is bleeding. I, I, I saw there's a, a speech by a gentleman called Eugene Debs from 1918. Uh, a socialist worker in the US and he was being put on charges of sedition and the way he began the speech by saying something along the lines of um, I have a kinship with everyone on earth every man who has put his hand to something mm. hoping that their labor is going to produce something out yes, of it yes. and the yes. fact that they have been disenfranchised means I am disenfranchised the fact that someone is in jail means that I cannot be free and you know at the point of it at the end of that speech he said something along the lines of uh, we will grow weary in this kind of attention we will grow mm. nihilistic, we will lose spirit. And to me, I have to keep reading that because when I see stories like that, it's so easy for me to just see it as a news story and move on. But you picked it up, mm. you spoke about it, and I think you began a healthy conversation around um, what do we mean by free speech? Uh, mm. What does it mean to ignore an insult? What does it mean with tradition versus you know, the cultures that we have here? Yes. Could you maybe just tell me what you learned in that engagement uh, <laughs> in dealing with, you know, the insult that was lobbied at Buganda Kingdom and that you defending it somehow brought out the ire of people who thought you were saying something that I don't think you were saying. I don't yeah, think yeah so I, first, first I need to say, and a lot of top guys in the Buganda establishment reached out. Some are my friends, some have been my lawyers, some have been my enemies on the other side, quote unquote. Mm. But I mean, we, we vibe. So they reached out and they're like, man, you hate Buganda. <laughs> you hate Buganda. And I'm like, oh, that's cute. I, I could throw around my, oh, I'm not racist. This year is my black friend. <laughs> and say, no, I don't hate Buganda. Yeah. The, the, Look the, how the many black. Buganda friends I have. Yeah, but also I have a daughter whose mm. mother is a Ndiga clan lady. Mm. And I love this girl like life itself. Mm. So... I was going through all that card, it was very tempting. But I'm like, no, let's engage on the actual issues. Uh, the issue it transcends just this uh, bipolar kid, uh, Musana, who somehow um, thought that, oh, he should be the Kabaka of Buganda. Uh, first thing these guys reached out with was like, ah, this boy is not a Mugana, he's a Mugisu. I'm like, oh, I'm actually a Mugisu. Like, Fantastic. <laughs> so, how is this germane to the conversation? Mm. Uh, so, they're like, he insulted the Kabaka, he did what? He threatened the Kabaka's life, which, frankly, is very bad. You don't threaten anyone's life. It's, it shouldn't be okay. But also, society has set out legal guardrails within which you have to engage. Yeah. Uh, they're premised on the respect of human rights and the value of free speech. Uh, I, I frankly think that the solution to free sp uh, to, 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 to bad speech is more speech. Mm. Allow people to contest these ideas in the free marketplace of ideas and hopefully whatever wins gets on top. Mm. But now that issue of Buganda also showed another issue that um, uh, is, is even bigger and sadder. Because uh, um, the current Kawaka of Buganda is the first Kawaka in the more than 500 year history of the kingdom. And sorry to concentrate on this, you're from Toro. We could also just concentrate on Toro, but now it just happens that Buganda is in the no, picture please. here. So we'll use Buganda, not because I want to pick on it. Mm. In the 500 year history of the kingdom, he's the first king not to have actual political power. And this particular Kawaka has been very, very impressive with the way he ignores offense. Look at the provocation he took in that Kayunga mm. thing. Mm. It was extreme provocation for a king to be stopped from visiting certain parts of his kingdom. Yeah. 
yes, it's, uh, it's understandable that there were always people in Kayunga, that side of uh, Buganda, that uh, said, well, we, we don't belong to Buganda. You can go to the islands in Sese. There's some people who will say we don't belong to Buganda because, you know, Buganda kept getting these territories yeah. and adding them to it themselves. It also expanded. Yeah. Yes, it expanded. So there was always contestation. Yes. Uh, it's a political contestation. Yeah. It's not new. It's, it, it has always existed. But it is fundamentally right that Kayunga is part of Buganda. Buganda. But under extreme provocation, how did he respond? He kept quiet. He has and been probably quiet. saved lives, you know, because absolutely there were people ready to put their to, to put their lives to the nationalists. Soil, yeah. They were willing to die for the Kabaka. They don't just say it; they yeah. actually mean it. Yeah. And it's something really admirable. Now, if as society we do not recognize how much power that is. That a guy is going to die for someone that they didn't elect, a guy who has won the testicular lottery. Mm. <laughs> he is born. <laughs> what a phrase. Uh -huh. he, he is born that way. There's no merit. Okay? But another guy who has nothing in relation to this other person's life is willing to lay down their lives for them. Yeah. Comes up and says, you know, attack parliament today. People will fall in that parliament. Yeah. Okay? That man, in a way, has more power than some governments. But he found a way of exercising that power with so much restraint. He respected the power he actually had. Yes. Previously, those Kabakas had Emokajanga who drag you on your back <laughs> from uh, from uh, yeah. from uh, uh, Munyonyo to Namgongo and kill you just because the Kabaka sneezed. Do you understand? But now, as the Kabaka has grown older, he's getting a bit more frail, he's sickly a bit here and there, uh, looks like he's getting back in shape. You have minions around him who have taken it upon themselves to try and defend him, to show their loyalty to the Kabaka, mm. to show that, hey, Bene, Yariwo. Okay? I don't even think that man saw that video. Yeah, I would. I, 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 I don't think. How many insults are held yeah. at him daily? How much has been said? He How has much? So is, much yeah. poise. Yeah. It's admirable. So now these people will take it upon themselves to uh, trigger the, the the instruments of state power mm. to try to show, you know, their love for the Kawaka. So you get a Tom Magambo being. Uh, uh, activated to come and look for <laughs> a kid whose only weapon is a phone. Yeah. Yeah? They, they say, well, uh, we, 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 uh, they, they issued a, a very elaborate statement. We got uh, the uh, CMI. This is the chieftaincy of military intelligence. <laughs> uh, we'll get into what the misnomer that military intelligence is, but <laughs> at a later time, you know. Contradiction in terms, is that yes, what you're uh, An oxymoron, if ever there was one. So, <laughs> anyway, I, I don't mean offense, but if, if indeed these people are intelligent and they have at their disposal all the instruments of, the, of state coercion and state uh, intelligence gathering, they could have started by figuring out who this kid was. It is just beyond using, uh, um, using uh, geolocation uh, <laughs> capabilities and pointing out that, oh, this guy is this in Mbuya somewhere. Is. Yeah. Eh? That, is, that is not the intelligence we count on, <laughs> on you to do. You understand? Go and find out who the subject is. Why is he coming out and trying suddenly to claim he's the king? Mm. Why is he threatening violence? Is it a serious threat? Is it is a serious okay? threat? Is, is the, is the king is really? Things, yeah, or? who is behind him? If they had done that, they could have found, you know, this man has files in Butavika and all that mm. stuff. They could have been kind of, you don't throw a mentally sick man in jail, take him to Butavika, let him have treatment. Yeah. But also what that shows is, and, and the response in activist circles, which I was actually most disappointed by, was just silence. Yeah. Because we've come to recognize, because as activists, we think that we speak truth to power, but we have narrowed the definition of power into state power. Mm. We're just saying Museveni is the all-powerful guy with guns. But if Museveni is that all-powerful and, and has been able to take so much offense, mm. 
If Museveni seven responded the way the kingdom responded, all of us would be in <laughs> jail. Finished, yeah. Would not build enough jails to, to accommodate <laughs> us. You understand? So what this showed is that cultural power can be a lot less tolerant mm. than state power. It was a very bad uh, thing from the optical side of things. Not that I don't, not that I condone uh, uh, the content of what the was content said. of what was said. It's abhorrent. Yes, it's unacceptable. Yeah. But society has defined how you take offense and how you respond to that. Yeah. I should have the right to say a fool. I am saying a fool because I am using my definition of fool. <laughs> okay. You can disagree and say, I am not a fool. Yeah. Tell me, give me a discussion, your, 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 your side of, of, of that equation, but don't take... And also, there's, there should be no such thing as universal offense. Mm. If I've said Tony is a fool, I have limited it to Tony. <laughs> All Tonys are now <laughs> foolish. Yes. That's what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> So respond in a way that is defined by the law. Mm. It is how it is the price we pay to live in a modern society that we know how to take offense mm. and to respond to offense. But the moment we veer outside that those guardrails, we are calling for anarchy. We are calling for disorder, and a society crumbles that way. One of the best speeches given on, on free speech was uh, given by this guy, Mr. Bean, a guy who made his career uh, from uh, really not talking. <laughs> but you know, he comes out and says, and I think President Obama reacted this one time, that the best solution, as I said, to um, to offensive speech. More is more speech. Allow people to offend each other. They will arrive at a certain universal acceptance of common decorum. Society needs to course correct within the confines of the law. Now, uh, the, the, the activist's response was grave silence yeah. because they recognize that there's a certain power Mm. that cultural institutions have, which power goes beyond any normally recognized power. It is so amorphous, it is so ill-defined, but it's a proper cancer that eats up every one of us in our society. We all want to belong. And it goes against, I think, the traditional ideas we have of power. We think of power as someone at the top pulling strings and making things happen. Yes, they even not how diffuse it is and how, you know, in some instances, I also have power in terms of what my reverberations and actions can do in a certain space. Absolutely. Or, you know, even like, like guys in school, remember, uh, in, in school, there'll be guys who are not prefects, who are not in charge of anything, but they're making things happen. Yeah. And so you might look for who's the guy in charge to try and make things happen. But I think we, we, I think we underestimate how power is, but the other point that I think you're making that I, I want to jump on is, uh, I remember in school learning history about how the clashes in Europe were as different traditions came closer and closer together. Mm. And I think, unfortunately for us, Uganda is such a new thing. My, my father was there when the Union Jack went down. He keeps saying like, do you know how young this country is? So you've marched... I mean, the guys in Hoima are still there. They never celebrated. <laughs> So like the, we've mashed all these traditions together and I think unfortunately for us now there is a sort of, I call it a pseudo return to Africanness. And I think that drive for us to return back to, let's go back to being African or let's understand our traditions is because we feel like something was taken away from us. But every time I interact with people who were there at the time, it's not that simple. Like one of the things I've learned from older generations was there were people who are glad that the old way of things is going to change. There were people who didn't like royalty. Like there was already a diffuse opinion that existed around us. And now we there sort of have this thing. like us and Bagwere who, th who fought over <laughs> circumcision. Thanks. <laughs> so I think like we, the, the point you're talking about is because we are so used to the other being the enemy, I think it's, it's reticent for us to look upon ourselves and say, in what ways am I also engaging in stuff that is separating mm. us? That my love of my culture, just because it's my culture, there could be elements in it, in the way I'm perceiving it and the way I'm pushing it, that is detrimental to this mm. unity that we're trying to build and we need to refine it. So I, 
I kind of took the sense from <laughs> what you were saying that this is a conversation that has long been due for us to have and it's going to be very difficult for us to look only in the past to get those answers. Like you're saying, we have to figure it out for ourselves. What does it, it, a modern Uganda look like with all these different cultures and tribes and approaches to things and how are we going to coexist? Exactly. Now, uh, interesting you say that. Uh, besides that Buganda issue that uh, I was pretty much the lone voice, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to take that uh, as long as it's on principle. Uh, but I, I also agit agitated for recognition of Banyaranda. Mm, uh, I remember, yes. Because it, it doesn't make sense that our, we should frame our constitution in such a way that mm. uh, if I can't trace my grandparents <laughs> to pre-1926, yeah. I shouldn't be able to get a passport. Uh, Joel, you're from uh, Toro. I'm from Bugisu. I cannot tell you who my great grandfather was. <laughs> why? Why shouldn't that apply to me? If, if, if anything, you know, the 1926 thing was an arbitrary thing where yeah. you said, well, the last part of the border, you know, when these Brits cut off Uganda and gave it to Kenya because that that place was a desert, <laughs> they cut off all our legs and gave mm. some of them to them. Like they stopped chopping in 1926, so they're like, okay. Now the idea of Uganda has been formed, that's it. What of the people, the tribal people who used yeah. to exist, like Toro and Ankole and all those, the, the Renzururi kingdom, there, there, there was a constant movement of individuals. So just this sudden day, 1926, an imaginary line is cut, and then you can't qualify. Mm. So that also drew a very huge backlash, especially from the Buganda community. Same thing with the Balalo something we've been working on with public square mm. it, it it drew the same vitriol and you're like wait a minute we have a society we have a nation state uh, if you go back into the formation of uganda and, and you referenced europe earlier that these guys fought tribal wars until they kind of mapped out their own tribal <laughs> territories and said you're norwegian you're this you're this yeah. you're danish we shall exist somehow but you know there's some fusion, small time, but largely societies are, uh, are uniform. Oh. <laughs> I've never seen that guy. Oh. You've never seen him? I've never seen him, Seven. <laughs> You're about to see him. European Uganda, like the trade thing. Breaking barriers to trade thing, yeah. yes. Mm. So what they did was also move around and come and oppress us. So don't see them as, no, you are also oppressed. You are oppressed. <laughs> Let's not work together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Museven is a very good student of history. If, 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 yeah. if anything, you really need to admire that man's appetite for knowledge. It's incredible. He's a very good student of history and uses it to get his own ends. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, but anyway, back to this whole nationalist thing. We're going to have a serious problem going forward because when you look at, say, uh, uh, and, and there's really a reason as to why we don't necessarily have a prominent Buganda politician who has come to the top of this country in the entire history of the country. Mm. They don't last longer than one or two months. It's a dangerous thing. You know? And, and when you study the formation of Uganda, merging a lot of these different nations into one thing that really doesn't function. And to show you it doesn't function, look, the only way you will tell that Uganda as a nation is one is if the government forces move into Kasese and shoot up a stone, kill those people, and the same pain is felt in Bugisu. That's when you know that this that we're country, one nation. Yeah, we're one nation. Okay. Oh, let a foreign entity attack us. Oh, oh. And then we shall unify. <laughs> if a few million people are killed, Against those then, bastards. then we'll yeah. come together and stop recognizing our tribal differences and see Uganda for what it is, a very imperfect solution cobbled mm. together by British people who wanted so to make interests. their work easy. Yeah. It is a creation of commerce. It's a creation of economic interests mm. that suddenly we call a country. So now, if you see, say, a prominent Buganda politician like uh, Mr. Chagulani uh, 
come from the ghetto. This story is uh, Hollywood style stuff. Uh, but now he finds himself in a situation where he's dealing with the idea of Uganda as a general concept. He's not going to just be a president of Uganda. <laughs> he gets there. He's a president of some guy from West Nile. He's a yeah. president of some guy from uh, Karamoja. He's a president of everyone. And then on this other side, his uh, platform is written by largely Buganda nationalists. People who will say, you know what, uh, Buganda Contico and all that stuff, you know, we are decolonizing. A, a very amorphous concept that uh, even up to today I've looked at. Uh, it's still wrestling. Yeah, very brilliant people like Kalundi Serumaga explain mm. it. But then the more they explain it, the more they explain themselves into a bind. Uh, and you're like, okay, so the, the, the full... The, if you roll this thing out to its rightful conclusion, you're saying we dissolve Uganda. That's what I've always thought. I don't know why the conclusion seems... I once said that seems to be the conclusion, and I was told that I am sowing seeds of... Uh, disunity. Yes. But I was saying the contradictions just in it, the it, whole framework lead to that. It's, it's, you, you don't even have to peel that onion so, <laughs> so, so far. Just one or two layers, you'll yeah. get to that. Yeah. So then, then what? You understand? So if I'm a Buganda politician and I owe allegiance to the Kabaka, as I should, because, you know, that's my culture, but then I also owe allegiance to this document called the Constitution. How do I wrestle with those two mm. and still maintain a semblance of order in the society? Yeah. Is it enough for me to just say, you know, oh, you guys live the central part of this country. This is now our territory. But it was probably your territory because you were the colonial master's lapdog. You also happened to be in an area that had a few lakes and whatever, and they wanted the beach life. It depends on where you start the story. I think that's the yeah, thing, right? Like you may say, oh, I've lived here for 12 generations. I was like, if we went back those several generations, uh, you know, interestingly, even in the US, whenever I would say I'm East African, mm. the thinking there was East Africans, uh, Somalians, Ethiopians, and the rest. We are meant to be the West African Bantu with the Bantu migration that came through. So, to a certain contingent in the diaspora, they were looking at us like, "Aren't you guys also colonizers?" And I was like, "Wait, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute, hold on, what?" They were also colonized. To your point, that someone else came and did it to us. I I feel that what you're talking about requires us to have such an understanding of how Uganda came to be. Yes. Those reasons, beyond the reasons that were told to us, you know, beyond yes. the things that yes. are said, yes. which yes. are high yes. yes. and, yes. yes. and yes. great. Very However, well. I don't think political consciousness is top of the agenda for even the middle class of this country. I use middle class yeah. roughly. And this is my feeling, and this is where I want to drive mm. your thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, we are so... I was talking about us becoming neoliberal subjects in terms mm, of mm. itself. I have to make mine. Because to be naive is to think we're going to work together, get things done, we we'll engage in politics. Even in the office, you say, oh, that guy is just in politics. It's just, it's a dirty game. I think it has been painted and mud as ineffective. Government doesn't work, it doesn't operate. The public sector is where thieves are, such that brilliant minds, genuinely brilliant minds uh. that I've had the fortune of going to school with, almost none of them ever talk about pursuing a political career. They only see it as politics is a means by which you're going to make yourself survive and make sure you, you know, cozy up to it and be, don't look like you're threatening the status quo, but get yours. Get yours because someone else is going to. Now, I <laughs> may sound very pessimistic, but I think the trouble is much graver than we realize. Mm -hmm. I've located it in ideology. I'm, I'm sure there are other people who will say it somewhere else, but to me, the problem is ideologically, we think we're going to entrepreneur ourselves out of this mess. Uh -huh. We think we're going to gain wealth, we're going to, the oil is going to come, somehow money will come mm -hmm. and solve over these things. I am quite doubtful. No, I would want to hear your thinking about what do you think the political consciousness of the class of people who have some access to means of production, who have some access to some form of leisure, typically the people who are the thought leaders or the people who are, yeah. you know, training the next people are going to be engaged. Do you think that people actually understand politics, are engaged in politics? 
um, and <laughs> when they characterize it, how would you say they characterize activists? Because you said the word you're an activist. Yeah. yeah. In the circles that I mean, when someone hears activist, violent, they, just they don't listen. listen to throw things. He's yeah. ideologically persuaded, so it's seen as we are not ideological because we focus on business. We are about the market. Whereas someone who's talking about structures is ideological. Mm. How, yeah, I've said many things. I would like to hear your Yeah, yeah. so we, first of all, we exist in Museveni's patrimonial system. Mm -hmm. Let's first understand that. When we understand that, then you'll understand why the noise we are making about someone like Anita Monk in the boss's book is actually a plus for her. Okay? This system is built around maintaining an individual in power for whatever it's worth, good or bad. Um, and it's built on the quicksand of corruption. It's maintained by throwing more trucks of public <laughs> money. Because it's quicksand. Keeps moving. It keeps giving way. <laughs> keeps moving, keeps giving way. Put more. Whoever comes into the system oils it with corruption money, takes some and does whatever. Mm. So when you get down, when you understand politics that way, especially in as far as Ugandan politics is concerned, it, it then will, uh, will, will first center you. <laughs> you understand, it, uh, like this parliamentary exhibition that my, uh, my friends and I have been doing, mm. um, it has showed that we do not have an opposition in this country. We just have a collection of individuals, a cabal that has made a pact and said we are going to eat on either side of the political divide. Okay? And when you peel layer upon layer, you get to an, a very uncomfortable truth. You discover, oh, Empuga somewhere sat and gave himself money. Mm. Then his friend, say, Segona somewhere. Mm. His friend, uh, Esemuju somewhere, very celebrated visionaries and whatever, luminaries of free speech and democracy, <laughs> suddenly they swallow the whistle. Suddenly they're very quiet. Suddenly they're very quiet. They are defending, they are speaking a certain vernacular that you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, you know the term, they go, oh, let's, let's maintain peace and quiet. Yeah, let's you maintain let's peace and quiet. Maybe she's not as bad as everyone else. You start yeah. hearing those. Yes. But what we've done is, uh, what we're looking at as, oh, this lady spends 500 million shillings every week. That's a political slash fund. It's not CSR. It's a slash fund. It, it is being used to buy power, to maintain the status quo. So then, good thing that's coming from exhibitions like this is that the middle class the lower class and even the high class that we've been recognizing as informed by business yeah they are now suddenly realizing that they are out of the chain too <laughs> we <laughs> thought we were in things yes no you're not <laughs> i'm here enjoying crumbs while people are taking the whole yes. loaf they are, this, they, they are out of this thing but then when did we ever create a society where politics exists to serve people's commercial interests. That whoever is looking at this exposure thinks, oh, why don't I target the next, and, 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 and I've shared this in a very, very <laughs> satirical way. I said, I need to look for the next rising star in NRM as a female and be a magogo. Yeah. Eh? Get the speaker, just make sure I am aligned with the next speaker. <laughs> you know, we've, bastardized yourself, yeah. we've bastardized our what? Our political space. People are looking at uh, the, the parliament and they're like, you know what? I need to get in there and also eat. Yeah. The cost of financing a basic parliamentary election is at least 500 million shillings. The amount of money these people are supposed to earn every year, even if you said you're not getting taxed. Normally, it's going to be around 20 million, 25 million shillings per month. Okay? So let's say 20 million. Or, yeah, 20 million, let's say that. Top end on average. They will need at least three and a half years pretty much to recover what they put cost. in to get there. Now, a lot of them get this money from money lenders. That's why you had a lot of Indian money lenders out there maintaining loan, loan, loan books that they also pass to state agents. 
to know who is extremely leveraged so that we can what? <laughs> Squeeze them next time. You say anything bad about the government and the lone man, the lone shark the advertises your house. Yeah. You understand? So we are running a political system purely on patronage and sharing out state resources. So we need a reset. And now that reset cannot come unless we build the societal conscious. Let's go back and say, what does it mean to be a Ugandan? Okay? What does it look like when you live in a functional society that has social safety nets? Where you don't have to think that a very sudden, unfortunate bout of illness is wipe going to wipe you out. Yeah. Okay? Where we don't exist just to pay black tax. Right after we are done giving money to your to spend as they please. <laughs> you understand? Then you have the tax that comes with existing here. So how do we build that reset? Then I'm like, okay, what's the largest uh, percentage of Ugandans? There are people under 30. Can we engage them from their point of um, wherever they are? Can we find them where they are? Yeah. And just tell them something about nation building, something about politics from a non-partisan way, a, a perspective. I'm, 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 I'm frankly not sure who between Bobby Wine and Museveni <laughs> would vote for. <laughs> you see holes in both areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, I interrogate these, these issues from a very dispassionate, a very, uh, very, very unbiased lens. Can I, can I say something about what you just said? Yeah. I, I disagree slightly with you. You're saying that you're dispassionate. Oh, 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 oh. Let me tell you what I think. Yes. I think you're passionate, but you're passionate about the principles. Exactly. Right? Those so for are you, what? like, who, who's driving us here? How are we getting here? I don't think you're passionate about, I'm now loop, or I'm now UPC. No, uh, exactly. That, you're like, that, oh, that, where is it taking us? What, what are we trying exactly to achieve? Exactly. Now, that's, that's, yeah, thank you for the correction. That's what I mean by dispassionate. Mm. It's the principle that I obsess about, not the players. Mm. These guys are one hard attack away from being wiped away. Just so like I am. Yeah. Like, just like you are. We all get up. But then, can we put the Ugandan experiment, a daily experiment, above any of our personal needs? Do you think people are bought into Uganda? I, 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 let me, I'm going to play a little bit of that. I would argue, for instance, that most people do not really believe in democracy. They don't really. But, um, irony and self-distance again this is why i think ideology is what keeps things as they mm. are i think because it's like uh, i was watching what is it love is blind mm. don't judge me people i also try to be that so as i was watching it, you know, i was telling myself i'm watching this for entertainment like um, it's a guilty pleasure uh. but whether i'm doing it ironically or not i am doing it in the same sense, I think we practice democracy without really believing in it. Yeah. And what you're doing now is because you're saying things have broken down, you are showing us what we've known all along. Yes. Because I don't think anyone sees what's happening in this parliament exhibition. I don't think anyone's in the porthole and none of those exhibitions is giving new information. Mm. It is just saying that the stuff which we don't talk about, we can now talk about yes. in a public space. Yes. Right? Now, my query there is what what does success look like in this effort you've said you want to find where you know the mm. vast majority of us are young ugandans a lot of us you know on social media is where we get a lot of our information mm. and now we're engaging it's really picked up a lot of bluster and it's starting yeah. a lot of uh, discussion but <clears throat> what i'm seeing is tempers will go up animation will rise but then where does that person go after they've yeah, they, they, they've been pissed off enough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, sorry. Ask, you ask the most, the most piercing questions. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's uh, in a very subtle way. Uh, I'm glad you started by giving me coffee. <laughs> we'll go back to um, December 17th, 2010. Okay. Uh, um, Tunisia. Uh, uh, the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring um, you found that people were felt economically disenfranchised. Yep. Uh, President uh, Zene Abdulaziz 
um, had ruled that country for 23 years and he essentially set up what you're seeing in Uganda now, uh, like how Uganda is now, that the people who actually owned money, owning money simply means, you know, it's, it's not enough that you have a company that turns over billions of shillings. If you have true money, I want you to tell me that for the next 20 years, you will not work mm. and still maintain your lifestyle. Mm. Very few people have true money outside politics. Mm. So people are not blind to that. Yeah. They just need a spark in order to say, man, we need to, dis to, to course correct. Okay. So Tunisia, Abdulaziz, this market vendor, who used to be harassed by police, taking away his Chigali almost every so often. Like how you see cases here going downtown mm. and, and taking jackets, taking whatever yeah. of these people. And you know, they go back and hustle, sell like a piece of land, come back, put a stone. Same, put Same. on repeat. Yeah. Okay. Eventually, this man just set himself ablaze, 17th December, 4th January 2011, he dies. Ten days later, President Zena was on a plane down to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. So you just never know. Not that we want a, a, a situation to happen where people riot and President Museveni goes. No, I would much rather we introspect, have these conversations. We've all, oftentimes been accused as called elite. It's an insult in, in today's world. I don't know why it became <laughs> yeah. elites. It's, it's bad to have knowledge. It's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's an insult in today's world. The messenger would say, oh, uh, people I hate the most are the elite. They sit down there, protect their loot. Uh, you know, a guy has like a four-bedroom house in Nigeria, a second-hand <laughs> Japanese car child goes to Kampala parents, can afford 500k to rent an apartment for side chick in Kira. He has achieved the Ugandan dream. Kampala dream, yes. To gende, to gende maso, to gende maso, muzei ya o, tova kumain. But now they are realizing that actually they don't have power, they don't have money. So they are being scared back into the political process because now the political process has been owned by the ghetto boys. They were saying, you guys who are counting on you people with degrees who are told you go to school, you mm. learn a lot of things and then you can lead. But look at what you're doing, you're the ones who are stealing our roads. You're the reasons our women go to hospitals and die in childbirth. Let's do it ourselves. So the ghetto has led the movement. Now the so-called elite, the people who have gone to school, we've gone to the US to study. We could have worked in Goldman Sachs. I, I, I'm not just attacking you. No, I'm no, also please, no, no, please, we're here. We're here, all of us. <laughs> Even that, okay. <laughs> I'm also proud of my US education. But, mm. you know, we have gone to school. We've seen how functioning democracy, I mean, I'm calling the US a functioning democracy. Relatively speaking. Yeah, yeah. How they, <laughs> they, they, they work. And, and we should want that for ourselves. So... How do we engage? How do we push? How do we get now this elite person to meet the other ghetto boy, uh, ghetto woman at, at their point of need and say, look, this is a collective effort. This is our Uganda. We all want to, to exist in a society where not just politicians are the owners of capital, but people who slave away to build their lives then suddenly yeah. become the real owners of capital. Now, what's the end of this activism? I do not know. For me, I believe that raising the conscience of society to demand more mm. for, from their leaders will then push them to be able to select leaders that are more accountable. Mm. These guys have been shaken. You look at Obori, I think he even creams his pants, <laughs> pants on TV trying to defend this stuff because it's extremely <laughs> difficult. You understand? So make them uncomfortable. Yeah. These guys go to the same churches that we go to. Yeah. They go to the same shops that we go yeah. to. But they get off being uh, the richest fools in the ghetto. Can we continue existing like that? No. So if we awaken the people and get them re-engaged in the political process, perhaps we'll have a more accountable leadership. Mm. Uh, when you look at the Ugandan demographics, they, they make for very sad reading. Uh, if I asked you, how do you, what percentage of Ugandans do you think uh, Museveni's age and older? Ooh. Say 80 and older. I would be surprised if it's more than 5%. It's 0.4%. 0. 
Uh, 75 to 79 now that's that's the group that fronasa and what have you mm, mm, the ones who have mm. all these houses in kololo or had mm. them and gave them out at the price of a song uh, because they didn't know how to do business they didn't know nothing uh, 75 to 79 0.4 percent 70 to 75 70 to 74 0.7 percent 65 to 69 0.8 percent So essentially Ugandans from the age of 50 to 100 are less than 15%. The average I mean the median age of a Ugandan is 15.7. Yeah. Um uh most Ugandans like 60% were not here when the current government came into power. We are still being led through that ideology. The youth minister uh Sarah Mateke is going to be 50 in July. <laughs> NRM the, the <laughs> Central Executive Committee does not have a youth yeah on its yeah. on it not even one uh, <laughs> my friend Gaddafi cannot closely <laughs> come to the definition of youth <laughs> you understand they haven't held those sec elections in two cycles <laughs> it is it is sad yeah. absolutely atrocious you understand so but you also can't blame them they will ask you can you show us any youth who is ready to lead of course that is a self serving question in and of itself yeah, it's like people who argue about all oh, this generation is spoiled i'm like who parented them yeah uh-huh. who parented them we killed political science education in schools Absolutely. we no longer teach civics Absolutely. a guy cannot show you where masaka is on a map you understand a guy cannot tell you Uganda what, what informed its formation. Eh? A guy will go to Mackinon Suites and you ask him what is Mackinon mm, to you. Eh? Yeah, who, who is Mackinon? Who is named after you? Yeah. Who is this guy? This was Uganda's owner. Guys <laughs> <laughs> will give it up the country. You understand? This is the guy founding member of Ibea called mm. guy. You understand? Eh? But we still have his name proudly on our streets. So that tells you the society is not politically conscious it is not civically engaged so can you then start something like public square which is a poor man's think tank and then come and get kids yeah. like, young people like you to just come to marketplace of ideas and test each other out mm. and come up with policies that then can inform the next phase of leadership mm. because yes we can complain about Museveni blame him for everything. we can tweet forever yeah we we will say you know you go to the village and those people will will blame Museveni for broken tap mm. but is one individual really that powerful and i think to your point we've made um i need to land this point carefully i think now um Museveni has become this totem this creature this being this entity yes that in some instances excuses our own inactivity we were talking earlier that yes. the thing that i find really weird is when i go to church and then there are people amongst us who are like oh i i haven't eaten i need a job and then we pray for them and leave like at that point like how many of us here have stuff that we can meet that person's material needs mm. but we look to the father above and go hey let that person help you in some way i think he exists as this totem and even when we look at the opposition a lot of the opposition is remove this thing but what happens i know uh, slavo is is keep saying that thing of um you can get people animated enough till they get to the revolution what i want to see is what happens the day after ah yeah the day like after what happens exactly the day after the so the day after the day after is what we don't have answers to and so whoever is pushing Museveni again they Museveni again they you ask them where is your manifesto what do you want to do after day one you in nakasero plot one or you in entebbe <laughs> what are you going to do yeah so, Who? Say it again. Uh, You're going to start no, no, a fire. No, not because he is the best, but it's like don't be in the fire and not give anything. We just have another 20 years. Actually, I want to, I want to no, I want to explain that. Idea. No, I I let, let me tell you why I think that idea is starting to get out of purchase. Yeah. I there's something that we're all afraid to say. And I think what we're afraid to say is that 
when I look through history, in fact, when you look at the Arab Spring, mm. it was to me at the time I was not here, I was um, working with people in the northern hemisphere of this world. And for them, the people who are politically conscious had become largely identitarian. Where you go, I am anti-capitalist, and it's a, it's a, it's a badge of intellectualism, yeah, right? It's one you wear, a Marxist, ah, Leninist exactly. in approach. By the shirt, I'm a Marxist Leninist. I'm like, guys, come on, like Jay Z is rapping about Fred Hampton. Uh, like, what? <laughs> a billionaire. Anyway, but the thinking was always that when the consciousness arises in the third world, that we would be the ones who would unseat power. Yes. And now the thing that has come back to me is even here. I suppose there is the danger of us going that we, we are invested in the system. I live a contradictory life in that I am at the brunt of what capitalism is doing, mm. of what the system is doing and the way mm. it has been set up. Mm. But at the same time, I'm invested. I check my provident. I'm waiting for my media access. So I am more likely to uh, start saying, oh, I'm closer to becoming um, I don't know, Patrick Mitature, bad example, <laughs> Patrick Mitature, <laughs> than I am my border guy. But in reality, in the material ways, I am much, much closer to that person because yes. my means of, what I offer on the market is my labor. Once that is compromised at any point in time, there will be a car wash. Yes. There will be people coming around. Suddenly we resort to the community after all the things we've been trying have I broken down. I can't possibly put it any better than you have. So now what he's well. saying, I think, is there is the fear that all right, I'm going to lose what little I have and become like those, like what George Carlin kept saying is that the poor exist to frighten the people who have a little bit. <laughs> like, you're like, yeah, so I think that even the disdain. Boogeyman. Yeah, the disdain that you are hearing in Bessie's voice is that there is a disdain in that you are close enough mm. to actually do something brave. But the closer you get to being invested and enfranchised, the hard for you. It is so hard to change things. And throughout human society, and this is where I'm throwing you the challenge, I've only seen revolutions happen when people cannot eat. When, when you know, that's why they talk about the French Revolution was, we have no bread. We're going to finish you mm. off. Now here, the, the, the master stroke I think has happened is that we live in relative abundance. Relative mm. abundance, you can eat. So we just have enough to keep us going, mm. but our angst can't really go far because the angst that's being felt by someone in the middle class seems different from the angst than someone who's not eating although it's rooted in the same thing yes so my concern with what he's saying is it seems to be that true change will only come through fighting i i, I what's your response to that i frankly hope not and i i, I know many people who argue that the best transition is a Mohosi transition and the argument is rooted in the understanding that he holds the levers of uh, violence in terms of uh, having control over the security apparatus of this country. So yeah. at the very least, we should ensure that there's no bloodshed or there's no violence. But be that as it may, and I hope really fundamentally we never have violence i am not a believer in violence this country violence suffered in that of, well. of power i am a believer in using ideas coming to a marketplace and using those ideas whichever winning idea comes on top is what we go with but back to the mohozi thing the people who are saying that and in the same breath saying we want a revolution just don't understand what a revolution is <laughs> It's breaking eggs yeah. to get this omelette. Yeah. There's always going to be a revolution for you to get a change of, of anything in any society. Now, Mohozi can also be on this side of the revolution. I've had him, quite frankly, get frustrated by seeing octogenarians and septuagenarians in power. Mm. In normal societies, we should be led by people his age <laughs> and younger. You understand? <laughs> Yeah. So he should come and join a common man's revolution and push and say, you know what, you and it among, we are tired of this corruption. He, he should lead a march to parliament and say, you know what, after he's a politician, let's not pretend, he's a politician. Let him lead a march to parliament and say, we are done with this madness. We want a reset. Mm. Then we shall say, look, this is now a common man's leader. 
But I feel like to sit there and say, well, and, and, and I have a lot of time for him. I think he's very misunderstood. From the outside looking in, I think he's a, a kind guy. He cares. But to just sit there and say, I, it's my turn to be in charge because I emanated from the testicles of this revolutionary, then that defeats the whole essence of democracy. You understand? So I, I, I pray for the day that MK will drop his military gab and just come and join the common man in the street and say, look, yes, I've been part of this system that has oppressed all of you. I recognize this. Okay? Can we then come collectively together and fix it? For me, that's the day I'll have a lot of respect for that man. I don't despise him. I can never stand up. I've never stood up and abused that man. I think he's misunderstood. But my bone of contention is you can't keep enjoying the comfort the that comes with the trappings of being a president's son in a very unaccountable society. And in the same way you say, I hate this system, I'm going to change it. Mm. It, it is extremely difficult. Mm. Not many people will cut the branch on which they are standing. Mm. That is the ultimate point of, of uh, that's the ultimate example of uh, stupidity. <laughs> he's anything but. That man is not stupid. <laughs> by any measure, he's a very smart military mind. You don't become <laughs> that by being daft. <laughs> so someone is selling a corn and it's not the public. <sighs> yeah. You understand? So I pray that MK comes up and says, ah, to call you banaki. Let's fix this. But also when you look at um, uh, 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 African presidents hmm. where sons have uh, succeeded, succeeded uh, their fathers, it's either by force of military or like in the likes of Kenya, Botswana, where the Kamas keep rolling in and the Kenyatans keep rolling in. A time has passed, another president has come in. Yeah. Do you understand? And then this guy comes in at a later date. Like the bushes even in the US. There yes. Was that car reprieve just, then. Just 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 study it very well. <laughs> Anywhere in Africa we've had I think nine eight or nine sons replace their fathers. It's either force like you've seen in Guinea, I think in uh, Central African Republic, South Kabira, Congo, uh, that's force. You see, he became a quote unquote statesman and gray, gray, gray <laughs> beard. beard yeah. A gray beard. That's why I was starting at that's, Joel's that's gray my beard. That's my, yeah, I'm going to hey. find it. He's even going to do his PhD. Pushed PhDs, and you see, the man is doing PhDs. You, you understand? There was force. So you cannot tell me that a day is going to come and Museveni is going to bequeath leadership to his son without force. If I was running MK's strategy, I would say, man, dude, come into the streets. He came to fix that is come on, please. Come into, <laughs> come into. I still have that picture of him seated in yeah. the TCA office and I'm going like, you guys. What's going on? You guys. Going on? <laughs> I, I come to the streets. Sure, we know you don't feel our pain. But pretend with us. Come tell us you feel our pain. Ultimately, I think a post Museveni Uganda is going to be a unified government. If it is not, we are going to have, look oh, at the way God. Museveni has built this country, that a person like Anita Mong is indispensable, not because Museveni doesn't get angry at seeing that theft. It is just that the political play is just too alluring for him to, you know, compromise it by chasing a few pesky <laughs> billions <laughs> of taxpayer money. It's not his money. Small, small change compared to the whole revolutionary dream. Okay? Now, when you go back to why, say, someone like Museveni will not fight an Antina Mong, we gravitate back to the Buganda question. Mm. Hear me out. Uh, when Obote in the 60s was, uh, and, and my father can lecture you about this in his sleep, and 60s, 70s, 80s, Obote was a Republican par excellence. 
he knew that to win he needed to build some sort of republican coalition so he went and said well in the 60s i can get buganda i can get he wasn't so obsessive about getting the west but you know mm. i can get the north i can get the east gets that then 1966 happens and he has to reimagine that map okay so how do you build a, 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 a republican coalition to get you at least we, to give you a shouting chance at yeah. the presidency so the rest you can top up by rigging but to give you a shouting chance you can't rig when you have 10 <laughs> to 90 or you can rig when you have 45 to 55 and so how do you build that coalition he's like okay buganda is out of the question let me go and pull a charm offensive on ankole up to today obote is popular mm, he is. in ankole he, is. he spent a lot of time there he goes to mbali He goes to God knows where. Promises Mbali you're going to be the new capital city. Promises God knows where. He goes to the north. Eh? Builds that coalition. Now look at Museveni's winning coalition mm. in the coming election. He's cutting Buganda. He knows mm. he will probably get 10-20%. Mm. He'll go to the east Busoga and Mbali Bugisu and flex and probably get 40%. Then go to Teso and sweep that. Because, you know your daughters who are fighting amongst themselves <laughs> vice president and the and the you seeing these squabbles uh, yeah. these are your people yes. the vice president and the the, the third in command <laughs> when You're she's steering power. and I'm not touching her I am protecting your yeah, interests keeping your interests uh, oh, yeah. this man obore says we are in things he's communicating some, who is the we mm. he's talking about is he saying uganda is in things no With the people of Teso if you watch the full video he's even pinching her thighs mm. we are in things Museveni is not beyond playing that card so he has mapped out that I'll have the west I'll simply go and play Bobby Wine audios uh, mm. saying all sorts mm. of bad things about us westerners but they over be takaria for all that stuff then go and flex for Busoga and Bugisu then go and sweep Karamoja, Teso, sweep the north and then go and flex in West Nile. I'll have by close to 50% and then There's this other dude of mine yeah they can keep crying. This 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 dude of mine will do what? Will do the rest. Uh, the EC chairman mm. and then he will squeak out a win. But also you you see the seeds of discord that money yeah. can plant in opposition politics yeah. that now Bobby Wine and uh, who is this man puga may not even be seeing eye to eye it's 500 million shillings Over it's that, less yeah. than 200,000 yeah. dollars you're mortgaging the future of a nation how absurd you understand so the president yeah, knows Malik. that he controls the powers of coercion kamas he controls the finances he controls uh, violence he controls the security you can't arm. beat him yeah. In fact, if I was in opposition, I wouldn't even bother in the next election. The man is going to win it. Yeah. So he doesn't even have to rig that election. He's going to win it easily. But how do you prepare for a post Museveni Uganda? He's 80, 81, 82, 83 at the time the election comes around. The man is a walking risk. Yes, he's a muchwezi as we are told, but he's also a human. <laughs> They but, also disappear. Yes, yeah. <laughs> biology, biology yeah. works in a certain yeah. way. All men die. You don't want him to die now and leave it in this and leave us in this mess, God forbid. But I mean, read biostats, read epidemiology. You will see that he's defying medical odds. <laughs> so what happens? Yes, what happens can we then prepare a Uganda after him because this 0.4% of people who are controlling power can only go for so long. Then what happens to these you guys in Kololo? You were probably close when those ghetto kids he came to give them $400,000. Yeah. They're like, yeah. ah, mzee, ine to inacho tugamba twako wa. Shut up, shut up, shut up. You shut up <laughs> because they will keep quiet because he has guns there. Yeah. But when they overcome fear, you saw what happened Tiananmen Square. Are we going to have a Tiananmen Square moment? I hope not. Can we just have an engagement on a civil level? Can we reawaken the youth, which is where public square is coming from? Can we reawaken the youth to start talking about the things that matter to them? 
can they now define the new age of, of leadership that they want? I think it's because also we don't, I don't know how to put it. My, I've been alive through his entire presidency. L yes. Literally, it's tally one to one, January 23rd, and then the guys were in power 26th. The thing that I don't think we still young. How, how are you so smart? I don't know. I'm not clever. I'm just an artifice. Now, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. the point I'm seeing is we live in an age now where I need to maximize my potential. Yeah. I need to live the best life possible. I've never judged people who leave this country and say I'm going to make my way out. Of, of course, here. of course. Because I understand that me being here, I have chosen that I am invested in this country. But that investment at some point is at odds with the potential life I could see. Mm. Like I can see, oh, I could live and have a fantastic life and my kids will do well. We probably have to take our foot off the gas for that to build what you're talking about. Yes. And building what you're talking about is generations. And yes. the thing that I felt so envious about when I was, I mean, America is not a fantastic place by any means of no. imagination, but people bled and died. People gave up yes. who they were so that there could be pillars upon which these things could rest. The fact that Donald Trump didn't collapse the whole thing is not just some mythical thing. Prometheus didn't come and create that constitution, but it was built by people. Now, funny enough, we live in a world where it's supposed to be post that. Mm. Yeah, you know, we consume and we live a good life. What you seem to be selling, what we seem to be saying is that guys, there's a lot of work ahead of us. Not just work for us, but the work for our kids and yes. their kids' kids. Yes. That's a very hard proposition to sell. How do you keep hope? I've always wondered, like you, <laughs> Spire, Agatha, like, because uh, if someone sent me a message one time and said, what you're doing is feeble. Like you're trying to, you're fighting against the wind, you're moving uphill. Uh. Conventional wisdom would say, Tony, in fact, I think the reason people are surprised with you is that well, you seem to have made it. Why don't you just enjoy and go away? Why are you coming back into this fight? Into because pain. when yeah, when people look at the fight, it, it's a very uphill task. How is it that you, you don't lose yourself in despair? <sighs> and how can you expect... I mean, I think what I'm trying to say this is... I, I've, I, I've always loathed the kind of thing that says philosophy is going to be like motivation. Like you read it and then you feel, oh, today I'm, I'm going to achieve all my... No, it's supposed to show you how deep the shit you're in yes. is such that you can actually change it. Yes, yes. Now, yeah. getting to that point is very uncomfortable. Already life is giving me problems. I have bills. What's... Umeme. Now you're also bringing me to understand this shit. How, <laughs> how do you not lose complete hope? How, how what's your yeah, yeah. public so, square? How are you keeping spirits high? So uh, <laughs> you guys together with your spirits high. I call public square a, a poor man's think tank. Uh, we generate knowledge and uh, uh, defend ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about philosophy, really fundamentally. That's the definition. Every day you're going to have an idea that needs to be advanced an idea that needs to be tested, an idea that needs to be defended. Now, the idea that we are all fighting for is an idea of a post Museveni Uganda, mm. a functional post Museveni Uganda. Uh, um, how do we create that? Post functional Museveni Uganda, I mean, post, I mean, functional post Museveni Uganda is, is, is also encompassing a Uganda where Museveni still exists. Mm. How do you, as a society imagine that and make it work without burning the house down. Now, you talk about people like Agatha and Spire and people like Toko, people like mm. Isaac Semakade, mm. uh, people who wake up every day wanting to see things change. They come at it from very different perspectives. Agatha and Spire are very different individuals in the way they <laughs> right. view the world. Agatha and Toko are completely different. Then you have Semakade. Then you have all these guys. You know, they come together and they, they bang heads and whatever. It's, 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 it's a constant process of learning, relearning, challenging ideas, pushing narratives, activism. Does it work? Does it not work? Uh, in a failed political system like ours, where every politician that we know is a sellout, how, what, what hope do the masses have yeah. to ensure that things work? Activism. So then, in the 
the need of our time has to be served by that. Now, someone like me who is largely seen as an outsider, I'm a businessman, or I used to be, I'm coming at this from, I have faced this system on the other side where someone will buy judgments, yeah. where someone will falsify court orders and take over your business or take over your, your property. Someone, and shamelessly so, where someone will command the powers of state machinery to oppress you in all sorts of ways. For me, that's why I'm, I detest abuse of power. You understand? So, when I gamed that system of capitalism, at least for the short term, I'm like, how do I ensure that whoever is coming after me doesn't face the doesn't same obstacles yeah. that I faced? For me, that's what drives me, that the system is so failed that we need to burn it all down and build afresh so that the guys who are coming after us have it better. The work I do is not for me. Mm. I can afford to not work from today for the next 30 years and I will still eat. Mm. I'll still go to an uh, alchemist or God knows where <laughs> I'm born. Yeah. It's, I'm, I feel very fortunate, but I also don't live a very flamboyant life. Mm. Uh, my needs are very minimal. So I recognize that I am in a situation where I have an opportunity to put a building uh, block somewhere to create a better society for my children and my friends and people I care about. It is not altruistic. It is a very selfish drive. No, it's realistic, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, we it's all exist very, in a yeah. context. It's a very selfish drive. I want to see a better society for myself, for my friends, for my children, and whoever I care about. How do I do it? I can't leave it to these lumpens who are still in to build more castles. Okay? I need to come in and point it out, put my own resources on the line, put my life on the line. I've played for you some calls where guys, someone is saying, I will, you will be killed yeah. by my people yeah. or their people and whatever. And, you know, someone, that person continues to exist as a leader. Yeah. I recognize that they are very powerful, but I will come and put it all on the line and say, this is my skin in the game. What's yours? My border guys, whoever's come and lay it on the line and let's build a new society that we can all be proud of. Mm. Is it going to take one year? No. Is it going to take a hundred? Absolutely. But you know, uh, all we have to make sure of, uh, I don't know if you've looked into people like uh, Sarah Grimke, uh, mm. the, 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 the famous ab abolitionist Abolition. who said that um, we are not asking for much. All we are asking for is for the powers that be to remove their foot from off of our necks so that we can stand up and enjoy this yeah. land that the Lord created for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. It is not a very difficult ask. It is not unreasonable. Can you just allow us breathe and enjoy the airs that, <laughs> that God <laughs> granted to us? So if you can't ask for that, if you can't ask for freedom, if you can't ask for a fair representation, then you should ask for death. Either give me that or give me death. Mm. Eh? So the trouble with the Agathas, whom I really admire, I don't know, I think she has a problem. I don't know if she recognizes fear. <laughs> yeah, don't cut person. this out. It's Jeez. okay. It's, I think Agatha has a problem. Fundamentally, physiologically, we have to study <laughs> her as a, as a physiological specimen. <laughs> Do you actually have fear in no, you ice, as a person? Ice water in your veins. Yes. Like, this is a question that's rarely asked of, of, of her. I'm an outdoor enthusiast. I, I worship people who go outdoors, who climb, who do extreme sports. Uh, there's a guy called Alex Arnold. Uh, he, the guy, if you've watched Free Solo. Mm, yes, yes. Guy who yes, goes yes, and yes. climbs rocks, no oh. ropes and whatever. <laughs> it was later for now. This man had an abnormality. <laughs> but fear did, he is, didn't feel the fear, right? He's, and he also talks about it. His recognition of fear is not a normal human's recognition of fear. So I suspect that people like Agatha have that in them. And, and, and I think society needs people like that. We should <laughs> utilize what they have. Yes, yeah. let's utilize people like that because, you know, you need leadership at a certain level. I mean, a Bobby Wine, he's in Arua, oh God knows where, his driver gets shot. Yeah. That bullet could have yeah. met him. Yeah. The dude could have stopped copper. Yeah, he'd be like, ah, I'm done. Yeah. I'm out of this. 
and he would have quit but you enjoy know, my man that absence of fear look at them with seven is just like okay guys him going to the bush he wasn't an ordinary man i'm glad you said that because the seven is narrative i i respect a lot of the early stuff yes. right because i hear the father i could hear the i'm an intellectual i didn't want to do this <laughs> i had to be forced to get somewhere and i think for me the scary thing and this will be the maybe the last question for you is um the the, the when the wall broke when the wall fell down mm. and the berlin wall it was almost the end of history it was now this is the only world order this is the way things are going mm. the revolution of the people has failed mm. um and unfortunately i think when we look at our own revolution right mm. the these guys were marxist thinkers they were talking yes. about yeah the proletariat has to arise then they got the chance they got to the top yes and have become even worse masters than the ones before. They were pirates. Now they are the oppressors. Now. Now when I look at you I'm saying fine. Everything you're saying makes a lot of sense. Everything uh-huh. is good and dory. It's uh-huh. almost like me uh, being coming from a Christian perspective. Christians were always subtly happy being the opposition. Mm. Because then you don't hold the responsibility of hey, now I've given you the reins you're going to run stuff. Yeah. How is it that you are going to prevent the same thing from happening when we say we end it the, the president we start to rebuild we start to recreate stuff how what do you see is going to inject a sense of this has to never become where we went again because the very same powers that are in office now mm. said the same things there was liberatory screams happening when he stood and said we are here i'm not going to be president forever and i genuinely i think he genuinely meant it yeah. but there is a certain kanye told us no one man should have all that power at a certain because to reshape society or reshape our culture a lot of power will be vested in a, the people who bring that mm. change now we're asking those people to give that power back to individuals Could you give me your comment on why this time it will be different? Um, to be honest, yes, uh, for, for, <laughs> for, for someone to tell you that they will be different than Museveni without uh, putting together, putting in place safeguards mm. against human nature, they are lying. You see, you said uh, Trump came into power He stuck up a joint I honestly think he did. <laughs> <laughs> But um, the foundations of American society stood. It's because those guys through fighting through blood, tears and sweat built a system that is beyond an individual. Mm-hmm. Their constitution has not been amended. It's more than 100 years old. It hasn't been amended more than 10 times. I think yeah. Like yeah, it's slow to change it's and by like, design you don't just I should ch- it check the number of times it's been amended but for the time it's been in existence 14 it's 14, 14. it's, no, it's, no. it's not a ridiculous uh, a ridiculous uh, process and the reasons for amendment you really can see uh, they are <laughs> obvious you know we don't recognize women come on <laughs> <don't recognize> <laughs> come on you should enfranchise half the population yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so we need to get back to a situation where the constitution the law is a noose out of which no one can ever disentangle themselves kenya went through this in 2007 2008 mm. with those uh, mm. tribal killings politically inspired tribal killings mm. they came out of it with what devolution they came out of it with a stronger constitution the presidents especially this particular one has tried to mess with the constitution <laughs> here and there but ultimately you know the law gets him yeah. so you as as people who are pushing for a more accountable society i'm not really pushing for oh um, seven he must go i don't i think it's systems like i said let's transcend it's not really individual. what you're saying is the thing that he has wrote what he yes. has built yes. needs to go yes so now how do we have a new bargain how do we put constitutional safeguards that can pro- that can protect the ugandan experiment an ever going experiment from individual impulses if you have that then 
that question wouldn't suffice. Mm. Okay. So it's it's just putting in place constitutional safeguards that allow for a continuous existence of an accountable society, of an accountable country. For me I think that that's what we should fundamentally fight for mm. as a people. Mm. Once we premise our existence on the rule of law and unbiased application reading and application of the same then we shall not we shall not have Musevenism. because if we instead push for omusaja again day we're going to get rid of Museveni. and at no point shall we get rid of Musevenism. Mm. as we've seen that the people who are watching the blood bank are sworn draculas we have unasked this. It's clear to everyone that whether they say they are opposition, government in waiting, or they are the establishment itself, it's performative. They are all going to be united by one thing, eating. How do you make sure they eat within the confines of the law? Mm. And that when they eat, the office of the IGG will check them. The office of the Auditor General will check them. The courts will check them. A guy who comes and says, oh, you know, I was very disappointed by Honorable Semujung and I have a lot of time for that dude. He, he came out and said, you know, uh, let's just get rid of Museveni. He's the source mm. of all this. I saw that. Okay? Uh, Anita Mong, yes, I understand, I understand. Let's get rid of this. I'm like, but in Uganda, go back to Chitimba, Yemobi, that's one one thing. <laughs> Two, are you saying we should close the, uh, the, 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 the anti-corruption mm. court now until we can try Museveni in that court? No one else should We're get tried. We're not doing anything else, yeah. In that court. Is that what he's saying? Doesn't he vote to finance this court? Mm. Is there a vote on record where uh, Semujung Anda has said, no, this court shouldn't exist. All the inst institutions of government that exist to fight corruption should not exist because Museveni is still in power. If, if you find me that vote and say, this man voted like this, then I'll respect him and say he, 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 he argues what he, on principle. Yeah. But these guys who go with the direction of wind as defined by where the dollars are flowing, they, are, they shouldn't be the ones who are running this society. Whether they're opposition or not, they should all be kicked to the curb and we get a fresh <laughs> pair of people in there who will now reimagine Uganda as it should work for my grandmother somewhere in, in, in Mwanafa, for your guy in, 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 in Fort in Kiko. Yeah. How do you also remove Museveni's from the order? Because they've been pushed to think the one who's arrested the most is the best political, the, the best opposition person, the one who is. So how do you also remove that order? Yes, unfortunately, uh, that narrative of whoever gets arrested the most is going to be the biggest revolutionary, is flawed. It's built on the recognition that the state needs to exercise its power by oppressing its people, by arresting them. It actually recognizes the state's <laughs> right to arrest opposition. Yeah. So for me... It's actually conservative. Yes. So someone like Mugisha Muntu, mm. uh, of course he has all the charisma of a cold potato, but uh, <laughs> when you look at, at, at that man, <laughs> His arguments, when you listen to content, they speak to me. But he will not win an election because no, he hasn't no. been bastardized. No. He hasn't been brutalized. He, he, he you yeah. know, it's sad. But in a more functional society, he could be mm. up there among leadership. Mm. I hope that later, when, when Museveni moves on, maybe transitions to the kingdom of the Bachwezi, where his ancestors are now, God forbid, I hope that we have a national conversation that elevates voices like that, yeah. voices of reason, voices who, that, that now we are losing because they are jaded, the likes mm -hmm. of Besije. Do you understand? If now the current contestation was 2011, mm. the decision would be so mm. clear. Do mm. you understand? But the old man with the heart has worn all his opponents out yeah. by force, beat them, into submission or preferably bribe each one of them hand them a woman there hand them cash threaten them kill a friend you know do, do something that gets them to bend the knee 
But then when that goes, how then do you get rid of, of it from society? That when I stand and speak up, the response of the public shouldn't be drawn in a color. Those people who say mm. that, and there are many, and they don't understand the power of that statement, that they are recognizing the illegitimate action of the state yeah. to abduct its citizens. Yeah. They are looking at it as a way of, oh, the state, this is how it settles its scores. Ah, eh? what are you saying? Ah, huh? We are going to draw near Kalachia. <laughs> no, that shouldn't happen. That is the Museveniism we should get rid of. Anita Among and uh, the deputy and God knows what, the Chris O'Boris, all of this, even Ofono Pondo, who is fighting now, these ones, it's all an eating cabal. Those are symptoms. But the disease in there is deeper. It starts from the Motua Wansi and the elite coming together and saying, you know, we need a unified pact that puts Uganda above all our personal interests. Because when Uganda works, then our personal interests will work even better and we'll be able to pass on whatever wealth we've amassed. If success is going to be defined by wealth, that is, I, I'm a huge uh, uh, advocate of the alternative. But for as long as you know success is defined by wealth, you'll be able to pass on your kamuzigo somewhere to your Grand, great grandkids are not fear that a government official is going it's to come and claim. And you, but that's because you have built a society that worships rule of law over individuals. Tony, I uh, I don't know where you find the fire. It's I, in there somewhere. I it's think a, it's, it's an anger. Whatever you're doing to keep it going, I really admire it. It's Thank because you. for a long time I've just felt disaffected, uh, but. I feel that there is uh, there is work for me to do in also joining community and I love what you're doing in public square. Thank I'm you. Going to you promote it come, as high come. as possible. I mm. will take that invite that you've given. Fresh. What we're trying to do here with this thing is just try and make ideas available. I remember hearing. Oh, it's brilliant stuff. <laughs> but, I'm I'm one of your fans in Kamoli. <laughs> <laughs> you bring Pumla and then she's. <laughs> She's lighting up the whole joint and you're like, damn. <laughs> Let me tell you, PPJ is the most popular. We, we are coming soon. Uh, but I, I wanted to say that um, sometimes when I'm in the lowest of my expectations of where things are going to go, I read things that people write back to me or stuff that they've mm. uh, decided to jump off on and how they're enacting it. And mm. I, I, I'm just humbled at the fact that sometimes we don't realize the voices that we have. And mm. Yeah, I'm just happy that you've decided to take up that voice. You've not waited for Thank someone you. else to do something. And I guess to say to this audience that, um, you know, one follow, <laughs> follow Public Square. I think get part of the exhibition. I think the more of us, um, you, Alan had said something, he was quoting Succession, of course. Yeah. yeah. And he was talking about how if the slaves dress the same, they would see how many of them they are. And yes. how few are the people that are over us. Um, it's not an easy task. Um, that you're trying to get us to, but I think that it starts with us first realizing what um, what kind mm. of shit we're in. So, yes, uh, I appreciate so, your work, man. Yeah, so thanks. Um, I really, um, I'm glad you you, you invited me. Mm. Uh, I'm a huge fan, obviously. I've told you repeatedly. Um, so this is kind of surreal.